Welcome to The Laws of Style, featuring conversations on creativity, fashion, and the law from the leading edge of our economy and culture. Hosted by noted fashion lawyer, Douglas Hand. I'm joined by the founder of the menswear brand, Rowing Blazers, Jack Carlson. All of your experiences seem to influence your design ethos. Well, authenticity and meaning are extremely important to the brand Rowing Blazers. On a, on a more sort of agnostic level, a blazer is what? What's the famous quote? You're a legal scholar, the Supreme Court Justice, who said uh, he couldn't define pornography, but he knew it when he saw it. I think Rowing Blazers also has, has opened this style, having this inclusiveness element to it. When we come out with a new product, the drop it's covered in town and country and on high snobiety in the same week. And that's, that's exactly how we want it. Collaborations are something that for a young brand, you have done many of. The way I think about collaborations is that they've always got to be somehow adding something to the story. We have a few cool collaborations. Some I can't talk about, some I can, but in the pipeline. It's weird being now in the fashion world. I find any excuse I can to wear a blazer. And this is like the OG you know, and very fancy version. Hello. And welcome to the podcast, The Laws of Style. Downloaded to you from the offices of law firm HBA, high above Bryant Park in New York City. I'm your host, Douglas Hand, fashion lawyer, fashion law professor, and self-styled, well-dressed man. Uh, we have a treat for this episode. I'm joined by the founder of the menswear brand, Rowing Blazers, Jack Carlson. Jack, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Well, so Jack, you are undoubtedly a true renaissance man you are a doctor of archaeology oh, doctor of archaeology let me let me let me lay it out uh from oxford uh you're an athlete a prolific athlete a three-time u.s world champion competitor at rowing uh winning a bronze medal um during one of those competitions an author publishing your definitive work on rowing blazers uh i believe last year um and most recently, a uh, designer. So to start, just describe your transition from athlete and academic to founder of a menswear line. Yeah, it's weird being now in the fashion world, being in this industry. It's not what I studied. It's not what I sort of was trained to do. But my intro to this world came with the book, Rowing Blazers. And I launched the book with Ralph Lauren. We had big launch events for the book at the Ralph Lauren flagships in uh, London and in New York, uh, and also the Newbury Street store in Boston. And that was my first sort of entree into this whole universe. Um, and the book, which when I was working on it, I was thinking very much of a rowing audience. It actually ended up resonating a lot with a much more fashion oriented audience. Um, and it planted the seed of this idea of actually taking a lot of the research um, that went into the book and creating a brand out of it. Um, it was a long and drawn out process. The book actually came out four years ago now, which is kind of hard to believe. The book came out in 2014. Uh, the New York launch was actually in the uh, Fifth Avenue Polo store, which doesn't even exist anymore. This was the first event in the Fifth Avenue store. Um, but yeah, I, I immediately basically went back to Oxford, finished my PhD after the book came out, came back to the U.S., and then spent two years as a full-time athlete, essentially, on the, on the U.S. rowing team. And this was my side project, was starting this brand or figuring out how to start this brand. And it was very much a part-time kind of project. It was a passion project, for sure. It was like an hour a day of sketching things out or trying to figure out where we're sourcing fabrics or designing buttons, or figuring out who's going to make the website, but a very slow and gradual, um, and gradual process. Uh, I moved to the city in like fall of 2016 and really started going, you know, full time on this. And then it took, uh, I don't know, about seven or eight months. And then, uh, I launched the brand in May of 2017. So it was a kind of back burner side project for a long time, but very much a labor of love. All of your experiences seem to influence your design ethos, you know, from, from being an athlete in this sport of rowing 
to your interest in archaeology, the legacy of things, um, you know, the cultural impact of things. Um, you're obviously acutely aware of the history of the blazer. Um, that's what the book is about. And, um, you know, I guess describe how, how you unearthed, if you'll permit me the term, right? <laughs> um, the, the, the resonance of this sartorial item, um, this, this relic in some ways from the past, but also this relevant item to the future and, you know, how that seemed meaningful to you to the point where you transitioned your really, you know, your, your entire life to being now in the fashion industry. Well, authenticity and meaning are extremely important to the brand rowing blazers. I think, uh, it would have been impossible to really create this brand or to have the same spirit to it if I wasn't from the rowing world, if I hadn't really spent five years doing a deep dive on the blazer, researching the blazer and creating the book. Um, and a few really cool things came out of the book. Um, I rediscovered in the course of writing the book and researching for the book the very first time the word blazer was ever used. That was a really cool moment. That, that we know of, I should say. Um, and what, what was that? I think I know. Before the book came out, there were kind of two competing theories about the origin of the blazer and the origin of the word um, blazer. And the leading theory had, had said it came from a Royal Navy ship in the late 19th century called the HMS Blazer, a Royal Navy fire ship, which was a real boat. And the story, the story goes that the... Uh, the captain wanted all of his sailors to wear matching navy blue jackets, and they became nicknamed Blazers and entered kind of the, you know, uh, every man's wardrobe, and it was nicknamed for this ship. The other story was that it came from the sport of rowing and that it came from uh, a specific rowing club, a college rowing team at Cambridge University called Lady Margaret Boat Club. Um, Cambridge, like Oxford, has many different colleges. They all have their own rowing teams. Um, and this one, uh, their color was bright red. So their jackets were bright red or blazing red, and they were nicknamed the Blazer because of that. Um, what I discovered while creating the book and while researching for it in the Wren Library in Cambridge in an old book called the Cambridge University uh, Almanac and Register, it was kind of like an annual yearbook for Cambridge in the 19th century. The 1852 edition of this lists all of the different crews for all the different colleges at Cambridge, and it also describes their uniform. Okay. They each have their own colors. They each have their own jackets. Some of them wear straw hats. Some of them wear, back then they wore baggy pants, or they wore shorts, or they wore checkered shorts, all kinds of different things. Early athleisure. Oh, right? it was great, yeah. And... uh for Lady Margaret Boat Club, it says they wore a bright red jacket or, and in quotes, blazer. And that was the first written use of the word that anybody knows of. And, I mean, I love moments like that. I'm a real, you know, menswear nerd. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I feel like I'm in, you know. You're in good company. I'm in good company saying that. Yeah. Um, and that was just a really cool, cool moment. But, you know, fast forward to 2018 and the brand Rowing Blazers, it's really about authenticity and meaning and everything we do we try to have a sense of authenticity to it a sense of real um real meaning to what we're doing so you know i think before the brand came out or in its earliest days a lot of people thought okay there's going to be crossed oars on everything or there's going to be these kind of like you know ralph lauren-esque crests that are kind of have an old-timey feel to it and you know, while I like that aesthetic a lot, what's really important to me is to be kind of like the real thing. Mm -hmm. And so we make the blazers, and this is largely how we started, actually. We make right. the blazers for a lot of rowing clubs and a lot of colleges all over the world. The actual clubs that go out there exactly. on the rivers, do the regattas, the, you, you outfit them. So We outfit so them, in we a make sense, their blazers, yeah. Right, like the new era, the champion, the you know the Nike, to the extent they've kind of, Nike and Adidas have jumped into that space for a lot of sports. You've been doing that for, for how long? Well, I guess it started probably fall of 2016. Okay. Yeah, and... Uh, you know, we make blazers for the U.S. national rowing team, 
for now for beyond rowing too for Cambridge University Rugby Club for most of the university rowing teams um, in England and and many here in the U.S. as well for rowing clubs as far afield as China, mm-hmm. which is pretty amazing because all of our all of our blazers are made here in New York. So the idea we're making these blazers here in New York and sending them to Chinese rowing clubs is kind of is kind of a cool thing. Yes, um, indeed, and a make, rare thing. Very rare. We make blazers for the German national team for Leander Club, which is uh, probably the most prestigious rowing club in the world. It's where most of the the GB national team are members for all sorts of uh, of rowing clubs, and now also rugby clubs, social clubs all over the world. Um, yeah, and I think that gives that gives some authenticity to what we're doing. I mean, indeed, can't call yourself rowing blazers if you're not making blazers for many there's, of these. There's an clubs. interesting irony here from you know sort of the, the the legal backdrop of of Ralph and and his brand um, that the U.S. Polo Association, which actually is a legitimate U.S. Association of Polo Players. Oh yeah, it's the national governing body. Yeah, right. Has has for decades really been in somewhat of a pitched competition with Ralph Lauren, who is really the recognized purveyor of legitimate polo, Ralph Lauren yeah. polo goods. So it's kind of an interesting element here that that you came in through a more authentic channel. Again, not to not to diminish what Ralph has accomplished and, and not at that all. association no. as an appropriate trademark because consumers do recognize Polo Ralph Lauren as as of as, course as a legitimate brand identifier, but not necessarily a legitimate athletic competition identifier. Whereas your brand, you know, really I think bridges both of those. It's funny, I was on the website for La Martina the other day, which is an Argentine company okay. that makes polo shirts and polo gear for okay. a lot of polo teams. And uh, I was just reading their little blurb and it was like, I forget exactly how it was phrased, but it was like, polo is our brand, not just our name or something like that. And they were, it was obviously kind of like meant to be sort Ar- of a, Argentinians don't, they'll, they'll throw it <laughs> down. Um, but yeah, I mean, and with Ralph Lauren, obviously, they've just celebrated their 50th anniversary. They've been in business a long, long time. You know, you see members of the royal family wearing Ralph Lauren. You know, I think with that time and, um, yeah, I mean, with as big as the brand has grown, they have, like, members of the royal family and they have, you know, kind of people who are very into streetwear now with their palace collaboration wearing Ralph. You know, they've... Um, you know, they've kind of sort of overcome with with time and with a lot of money and with, you know, a lot of work has, they've kind of overcome that. But, you know, I think for a very young brand, which Rowing Blazers is less than a year and a half old, it really gives us a leg up to have that authenticity. It really gives us a leg up that, you know, I was part of the rowing world. I mean, I was on the U.S. rowing team for years. Um, my girlfriend, who's part of the company as well, she's a national champion rower herself, um, and that we're making blazers for Princeton and for University of Washington and Cambridge and all these places, that gives us, I think, a real leg up as a very young brand um, and lets authenticity and meaning really be part of our brand. So for listeners who may not know, I mean, I have seen men... Um, go to meetings or go to brunch on Sunday in the blue jacket that accompanies their navy blue suit and think that they're in a blazer. Can you, you obviously make a, a highly identifiable blazer, but on a, on a more sort of agnostic level, a blazer is what? Blazer started as really kind of the hoodie of its time or the windbreaker of its time. It was truly sportswear. Um, it was truly athletic apparel. It was a warm-up jacket. Um, the blazer began as really a warm-up jacket that rowers at Cambridge and Oxford uh, would throw on to jog down to practice in the morning. Um, if it was a particularly chilly day, they would wear it in the boat while they're warming up. If it was really cold, they would even wear it when, they're, when they were racing. Um, and over time... Uh, they grew particularly attached to these jackets. Also, it helped that they were very bright colors. They often had 
you know, markings on them, stripes on the sleeve or badges on the pocket that would identify if you were in the top boat for your college or if you were the captain. Um, and because of those bright colors, because of those really distinctive markings, um, they were a way, they were a very good way of showing off. So guys started wearing them, not just on the water, not just jogging and practice, but they started wearing them to class. They started wearing them to lunch. They started wearing them uh, to parties. It like, was like the varsity jacket. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Or you look at, you know, chariots of fire. I was just watching the movie the other day. Um, all those guys at Cambridge are walking around in their blazers. And some of them are in their college top boat. Some of them are on the, you know, athletics, which is track and field team for the university. Some of them are full blues. Some of them have a half blue, which is like a versions of a varsity letter. Their scarf coordinates with the blazer, or maybe it's showing some other accolade they have. These were all sort of ways of showing off. Mm -hmm. So the blazer very quickly transitioned from being sort of true sportswear to being a staple of the English gentleman's wardrobe. Um, and it was really, it was a kind of rebellious thing, and it was a way of showing off. Mm -hmm. It was like the varsity jacket of the 50s where, you know, guys who became very attached to them, would wear them all the time. And it was really like a status symbol yeah. in a way. Um, and there were a few distinctive things that make a blazer a blazer. Uh, because they started out as a very practical piece of sportswear, they would be unlined in the back. Um, they would have patch pockets. They actually originally didn't have a vent. The vent came about as an innovation for riding. Okay, you right. didn't need a vent for rowing. And it... it um, it spoke to the simplicity of the garment that it didn't have a vent. Um, it was usually three buttons or four buttons so that you could actually functionally button it up and turn the lapels up and keep yourself warm. Mm -hmm. um, but the way it was worn, it would often be worn open or only with the second button from the bottom button. So it actually pioneered the three-roll two mm -hmm. silhouette of a jacket that's now very in vogue and that's very flattering in right. a way as well right. where the lapel rolls over and you expose a buttonhole in the lapel that is a functional buttonhole as well as the button exactly exactly um you know the original blazers were all made in bright colors or they would have contrast trim or they would have stripes um and that was a practical function too i mean they uh they were created that way. I don't know if you've ever seen a rowing race, but yeah. it's not like watching... Head of, the, head of the Charles. Yeah, it's not, it, which was just a couple week, weeks ago, but it's not like watching a basketball game. Um, you know, it's often you're very far away and it's hard to tell which boat is which. It's mm -hmm. also not like watching any sport on TV. I mean, this was the 19th century, but it's really hard to tell which boat is which. So these were actually, in a way, the original sporting uniforms. If you look back, I mean, the one of the few organized team sports in the Western world that predates rowing and still going on today is cricket. But cricket, I mean, it's like baseball. You have someone at bat and you have the team that's in the field telling which team was, which wasn't really an issue. It was very easy to tell. So right. they could all just wear white, right. which they largely still do. So the rowing blazer was actually part of the f world's first sporting team uniforms in a way they would have metal buttons. Usually if they had, uh, you know, they could often have an embroidery on the pocket. Those were, you know, the team or the college or club symbols as well. So that's kind of what makes a blazer a blazer. And most people's blazers nowadays don't meet many of those sort of stipulations. And as you say, people go around calling the top half of their suit a blazer. But that's not really what a blazer is. Got it. And so that is an odd jacket, correct? In other words, if I were wearing a non-sporting blazer, even if it was blue and had brass buttons, but had no other indicators of my affiliation and no sport connotations, it really is an odd jacket. Well, I would say like a navy blazer with metal buttons, I would call that a blazer. You know, and it's funny because we make we make jackets that are not blazers and we also make blazers and you know, I, I have to go through when we're making a new thing and, you know, we're a small company. I write most of the product descriptions and figure out what we're calling things. 
And I'm always in a state of kind of explaining to people why this is a blazer and why it's not. And it's it can get a little complicated and there can be a little bit of a gray area. What's the famous quote? You're a legal scholar, the Supreme Court justice who said uh, he couldn't define pornography, but he knew it when he saw it. Yeah, I'm not sure if that's Oliver Wendell Holmes or, uh, but, but yeah. You, but, uh, you know, there's a little bit of uh, of wiggle room nowadays. I mean, most blazers that most guys and women have nowadays it's a navy blazer right. with metal buttons you know a tweed jacket i wouldn't call a rowing blazer a seersucker jacket a pa- any kind of patterned jacket really that is anything but a blazer stripe like what you're wearing today i wouldn't call a blazer exactly yeah. and so you mentioned before that the product is made in new york not only all in the usa but all in the state of new york was that a deliberate choice, or is it just that your your resources um, had led you to to those production facilities? Well, it was basically a factor of of um, my living in Princeton, which is where the U.S. national team uh, trained when I was on the team for the most part. Um, and I just wanted to get this thing going, and I wanted to work very directly with the people who were going to be making first the samples and then making making the garments and uh i accumulated a pretty big collection of vintage blazers while i was working on the book no doubt and i would you know i basically would come up to new york on wednesday afternoons when i was training we trained seven days a week so there was not even like a day a full day where i could go okay i'm gonna go work on this you know it would be like for a few hours on wednesday afternoons normally i would come up here um had samples made at a lot of different factories as you probably know, I say factories. Most of these are like a room about this big with three or four people sewing things in it. Um, you know, and as you probably know, uh, uh, when you first think of a rowing blazer, you probably think of a blazer with grow grain trim around the edge. And I didn't quite realize before embarking on this adventure how actually hard that is to really do it properly and to make the folds around the notch of the lapel perfect but it's something that most people who i started working with or have you know asked for them to make samples really really struggled with and eventually i found i found one factory that was again like a really a small sort of workshop with a few people sewing things that really nailed it and that was very important for me and it was important that as we developed new product i was able to sit with them, to show them features of the vintage jackets that I had collected. Um, And that's really how and why it started in New York. Um, You know, I think it's, I think it's just a positive thing in general for the apparel industry to have the garment district, which is where our blazers and our pants are made in the garment district. Um, But it really started as just a sort of functional necessity of, I'm obsessive enough that I want to be sitting there and showing people how to do it and talking them through um, some of the details of these vintage jackets and looking at how they're cross-stitching things under the lapel or whatever the detail might be. Um, And I was living in Princeton, and there's certainly nowhere where we could do this in Princeton. So, you know, New York is just a train ride away. Yeah, Obsessive like... Most of the designers I know. That's probably when you knew that this was your calling. You have to be, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so you mentioned pants. Um, let's talk about Rowing Blazers, the company, and the other products that it offers. Because yeah. uh, you know, I'm looking forward to um, attending your launch. Although I know they're out there of of your new rugby shirts. So maybe just just take us through some of the product categories and how they came about. Yeah. So when we launched, we had blazers. We had um, Oxford shirts, button-down shirts, uh, ties, and a few accessories, hats, belts, etc. cetera. Um, the Oxford shirt was, was sort of the first big category alongside the blazer that we came out with. We didn't launch actually with pants or polos or rugby shirts at all. A lot of the things that now actually we're, we're known for. Um, but the Oxford shirt was kind of a natural second item to go with a blazer, of course, along with, along with a tie. Our Oxford shirts are also all made here in the U.S. Our ties are also all made here in the U.S. Um, But for me, it was like the blazer kind of perceiving a vacuum in the market 
for something that was really done the right way. I have a lot of vintage Brooks Brothers shirts that have that really nice collar roll, the S roll. Um, and, you know, I know there are actually, there are a few companies out there that are like, oh, we make the original Brooks Brothers S roll. For the most part, what I found is they're either too extreme or they're not really doing yes. it at all. Yeah. Right. And so that was something that I was also a little bit kind of obsessed about. And, and I was like, what? how is there no one who's really doing this kind of just right? Of course, it's a little subjective, but for me, just right. Mm-hmm. So that was something I wanted to do. And um, we also did something that was a little bit unique, which was we offered the shirts in a clean version and a distressed version that had a reverse seam. So when you're wearing a jacket, you can't tell it looks like a normal shirt, but when you take it off, it has a busted seam, basically. The shirt's enzyme washed, and it has this, um, yeah, it, it has these loose threads kind of coming off of it. Mm-hmm. Um, and that was inspired by this uh, other vintage shirt that I had that I wore all the time. I wore on archaeological excavations. I wore traveling. It was like my airplane shirt. The Indiana Jones shirt. And it was just coming apart at the seams. And I had to like sew it back together myself. You sew it inside out sometimes. And, uh, you know, it was a way of creating something that was both authentic, but also a little bit sort of fashion as well. And it's proven to be very popular with Japanese menswear nerds. And, of course, people who like that authentic S-roll collar and so on. Now, you know, the biggest category for us, which we launched about a year ago, is the rugby shirt, you know, outside of the blazer. Um, I had wanted to launch with rugby shirts, but we actually, it was just a matter of, um, I had a lot of samples made, and none of them were quite what I wanted. Um, I mean, you're noticing a theme here. I have a collection of vintage rugby shirts. You know, a lot of them are very high tension and are very heavyweight. And the embroidery is really beautiful. When you go back to some of the really old ones, the embroidery is all done by hand. And I wanted to kind of replicate that quality and just really couldn't find it anywhere. Um, And uh, eventually we started working with this French company that makes vintage style rugby shirts, basically. And, uh, And started working with them, developed a great relationship very quickly kind of expanded our rugby shirt business beyond what their capacity was and worked with them essentially to open actually new factory in, uh, in Portugal, their, their shirts were originally all made in France. Now they're made some in France and some in Portugal just to keep up with the demand for rugby shirts. I think we're kind of having a rugby shirt moment right now, but I mean, it's also it's also a classic. Are, Are we having a rugby moment as well? Cause I know the French team is actually quite good which may surprise some people who sort of think of rugby as a somewhat Anglo sport where, you know, New Zealand's always quite good. Australia is always in there and, and Great Britain is in there. Or I guess it's not Great Britain. It's Eng- England, England, Scotland, Scotland, Scotland Ireland, Wales, Ireland, and Ireland. Wales. Yep. Yeah. 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 Oh, Wales rugby is very Which good. must dissipate the great <laughs> British talent, right? But you, I guess, never see them all on the same team. It'd be, there'd be a lot of infighting. No, there. rugby league, which is the... It's sort of the more blue collar version of the sport. They have they compete as Great Britain, but then okay. yeah, rugby union, which is the traditional version that we think of. Yeah, they all compete as separate teams. But it's interesting. I mean, um, we are. Uh, I'm not sure when this is airing actually, but depending, people this will either be old news or it'll be a little surprise or a little preview. Um, we're actually going to start wor- working with. USA rugby and with the U S national rugby team. Um, they are, uh, they are in the middle of a, of a fall tour, basically, um, culminating with a couple of big matches, the women playing England and, uh, the men playing against Ireland. They've just played against, um, a few New Zealand teams in Chicago, actually. Um, but we are, we're making blazers and ties, uh, for the whole, uh, for the whole U S rugby team who makes their cool. rugby shirts who makes the official u.s team rugby shirt i think it's you know. adidas actually okay and it's i mean it's not like what you and i would think of as a rugby shirt it's not like the rugby shirts in our store right it's uh you know it's it's true performance moisture apparel. wicking exactly yeah which is which is fine i mean 
but it's very different from kind of what we're what we want to be known for and what yeah. we want to sell. Well, Rolling Blazers has certainly taken you know some of these iconic preppy you know Ivy League um, totems, and you know to a degree given some of your customer base, I mean, you mentioned Japan, you've done some collaborations with brands that might be considered to be street or urban wear brands. For sure. And and that style, much in the same way that Ralph Lauren and Tommy Hilfiger in the 80s and 90s, you know, sort of exported some of that style in somewhat of a cheeky way. Um, I think Rowing Blazers also has, has opened this style in in maybe its most legitimate way, but still having this inclusiveness element to it. Can you speak to that? And is that purposeful or did that just happen? Well, it's very intentional that the brand should be inclusive. It should be youthful. It should be anything but stuffy. So you're right that the brand is all about authenticity. It's all about doing things the right way. I mean, we work with these very prestigious clubs and colleges and we make the real deal. We make the real blazers for them and now starting you know to to branch into the rugby and polo worlds as well but you know i think just because you're doing something the right way and you're doing it in a very authentic and deliberate and meaningful way doesn't mean it has to be stuffy or exclusive and it's very intentional i mean the brand is is about both being authentic but also being inclusive and youthful and having a very kind of 2018 approach to these kind of clothes. I mean, if you look at what we're doing, if you look at the categories, they're very classic blazers, rugby shirts, polo shirts, Oxford shirts. There's nothing super weird or groundbreaking there. But I think what's different about us is it's two things. It's one is that we're making everything in a very authentic way, in a very old fashioned way to some extent. And that's where we're making it, whether that's New York or France. Uh, It's how we're making it and the attention to detail that we're putting into it. It's the fact that we are working with some of these institutions um, in the rowing, rugby, et cetera, worlds. Um, But the other big distinguishing feature, I think, about our brand is that it really is, um, it really is inclusive. It really is anything except buttoned up country club kind of vibe you know i think that's if you just hear the name maybe that's what people think you know if they first hear it and they don't know anything else about the brand but you're absolutely right once you start looking at our images once once you start looking at our site our social media you quickly realize that there's there's actually more depth to it than that and that's kind of how i think about it as well i think it would be very superficial very narrow if we were, you know, this super preppy brand that was trying to be very exclusive. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's 2018. I don't think that's going anywhere. I don't think that has really, I mean, I don't think that has legs is what I mean, you know? Um, And it also is a reflection, I think, of my personal taste to some extent. You know, I have very eclectic tastes. I try to think of myself as a kind of cultural omnivore. I mean, if you just read out like my my bio in three lines, it's like, oh, you did a PhD at Oxford. You were on the U.S. rowing team. I don't know, you know, you're from Boston. You lived in England. Whatever it is, it sounds like, oh, this guy's so preppy and like, you know, he's probably going to polo matches or whatever. Which I do some of that, but also like, I also listen to rap. I'm also reading hype beasts and high snobiety every day, and I think that's actually one of the you know, kind of biggest feathers in our cap as a brand is that it really has resonated with a much broader audience than just, you know, ex Ivy League rowers. You know, if you walk into our store in Soho on any given day, you'll see guys walking around with Brooks Brothers bags and Ralph Lauren bags. And you'll also see, you know, kids walking around with Supreme and Stussy bags. You'll see kids flying in on their skateboards and you'll see old guys from the Upper East Side coming in in their barber coats and shopping. And when we come out with a new product, the drop, it's covered in town and country and on high snobiety in the same week. And that's that's exactly how we want it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. No, and I mean, going to your, your first pop-up shop uh, launch in the Lower East Side at a, at a 
on a side street. Um, you know, it was, it was an incredibly eclectic mix, um, and ping pong. And, yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, it was great to see. It, collaborations are something that for a young brand you have done many of. Um, and I think they, they have informed your customers or potential customers with respect to some of your, your leanings, both sartorially or socially. Um, the most recent one that I can think of with, with the brand Noah. Yeah. Um, it, is that part of the business plan to do those collaborations and, um, you know, how is that working? Yeah, we, we've done a lot of collaborations. We've also, I mean, we've also said no to many, many, many more. Yeah. What the way I think about collaborations is that they've always got to be somehow adding something to the story. Um, and it doesn't always have to be adding things to the story in the same way or in the same direction, but it's always got to be at, you know, it always has to be adding another layer to the story. I think actually the same way about any stores that we work with. We are primarily a direct to consumer brand. You know, most of our, most of our business is through our own website or through our store in Soho. We work with a few select stores like Beams, United Arrows, but you know, we get asked all the time, oh, can we put, you know, we'd love to buy your collection and have it in our store. And we say no to 90 or maybe 99% of those. Just, and the same, we do the same thing with collaborations. It's like, as a young brand especially, we have to be very thoughtful about how we're developing the story. Um, and any collaboration that we do, any story we work with, needs to be adding something to the story. And sometimes that's uh, in a more streetwear direction. Sometimes it's in a more traditional direction. And I would say that about the stores as well as the collaborations that we do. We did a collaboration with J. Crew um, at the beginning of the year or in March or so. And, you know, it's funny because we, we had this Noah collaboration in the works. And Brendan called me the day, Brendan Babenzine from Noah called me the day the, the J. Crew collaboration was announced. He was like, what are you doing? You know, this is like, this is kind of a bad look if you're, you know, associated with, you know, what what he and I think we all would perceive to be a more sort of mass-oriented brand. For sure. Like J. Crew, And, you know, I kind of had to explain to him, look, we've done this in a very thoughtful way. We're not flying into anything. It's not like Rowing Pacers is now going to be in every J. Crew store in the country. We've done a very limited edition number of rugby shirts. And, you know, I think he called me maybe the day before it went live. I was like, I think it's probably going to sell out in a, in a day. You know, it's not like some long-term partnership. And he was like, oh, okay, that makes sense. But I understand what his concern was. And it speaks to, you know, how thoughtful I want to be about any collaboration that we do. And it turned out the rugby shirt collaboration we did with J. Crew. It was it was great for us. It was great for them, and it sold out in a day. Mm -hmm. It allowed us to do something strategic, to do something that made sense for both parties, and that was a really cool project. Yeah. You know, we've done something with Noah. That's, you know, Noah is a little bit more a streetwear skating kind of brand, um, but in many ways, our values really align with Noah. Um, they have the same sort of sense of taking things that are sort of quote-unquote preppy but presenting them in a way that is anything but mm -hmm. we have a few cool collaborations some i can't talk about some i can but in the pipeline with sperry topsider um that is probably different from i think what most people would expect sperry is a kind of quintessential american quote-unquote preppy brand i think yep. we're doing something a little bit in a different direction with them and then with barber which is a very traditional british brand so you know, it's always adding something to the story. It's always, in many cases, doing product categories that we don't already do, whether that's outerwear with Barber, footwear with Sperry, or it's taking it in a direction street with Noah, preppy-ish with Sperry, British, Anglo, you know, Oxbridge kind of with, uh, with Barber. Yeah. So it's, yeah, you've got to be really thoughtful about it. Well, so pivoting a little bit. Um, you, you know, in my book, the laws of style, which you get a nice shout out in, um, and you'll get another copy of at the end of, uh, our podcast, Thank you. um, that I talk about how professional gentlemen and there I'm really speaking to an audience that is lawyers, bankers, accountants, you know, service professionals, um, 
are, are well advised to present themselves and, and should always strive to look capable and elegant. And for me, that is mainly in tailored clothing because I think most people want to see their lawyer in a suit. You know? I, would, I would agree with that. Yeah, as your counsel, <laughs> as your legal counsel as well. Um, you have had various roles. Um, you know, both archaeologists and, of course, Indiana Jones comes to mind, like you should be dressing like that, or, <laughs> you know. Um, but now as a CEO of a fashion brand, how do you present yourself? Do you wear the line exclusively? Do you not wear the line? And, you know, what is, what is it you are trying to communicate to your audience as you make your choices each morning? It's so funny. I mean, uh, I went from being a PhD student at Oxford to... Uh, uh, actually, I spent, I skipped in my little mini bio. I spent a semester at a boarding school in Massachusetts teaching classics. Um, and in, you know, in both those situations, I feel like, you know, it's kind of natural. It's kind of what you want to do to sort of dress the part a little bit, which is sort of what you're saying too about how you dress as, as a lawyer. Um, you know, so you wear tweed jackets, you wear, you know, uh, you wear Wellington boots when it's raining in Oxford, like hunter boots. It's, it's like, it's what you do. You wear a barber jacket. Um, it's funny now I'm at, at the top of a brand called rowing blazers. The occasions on which I wear a blazer have probably gone down from my days of teaching classics at a boarding school when it was every day. Yeah. Um, you've got models for that. Yeah, I mean, I still f I find any excuse I can to wear a blazer, and you know, when uh, when my girlfriend and I are going on a date, even if it's to Johns of Bleecker, which is you don't have to wear a blazer to go there, you know, I'll put on a blazer because it's not because I have to, but because I want to, which is also part of the spirit of the brand. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but it's funny, like I'm not one of those people that only wears my own stuff. Um, you know, it's, it's not like Tom Brown where like everybody who works for us has to be in this uniform all the time. I mean, I love Tom Brown as a brand, but the idea of that has always freaked me out a little bit, <laughs> which I think is kind of the point, but I, I wonder now that he's been acquired by Xenia, if there are going to be any, you know, dress code infusions of Xenia product in the, uh, in I, what do I doubt it. I, I mean, it's pretty extreme. It's pretty extreme. I mean, you know, the people who are working on the sales floor in our shop, you know, are wearing head to toe rowing blazers pretty much. But, you know, I think it feels a little weird, a little phony if, as a designer. I'm only wear, you know, it's like obviously I'm inspired by a lot of other things. I have a lot of vintage pieces that I like to wear. Um, and there are other brands out there that I really love and respect and follow as well that that I want to have things and wear things from too and I think it's it's like kind of disingenuous to not acknowledge that yeah. you know or to edit it out of your own wardrobe right well it's an appropriate time for your four w questions related to what you walked in here in today so uh, you just describe for our listeners who may not be watching on YouTube what it is that you're wearing so so starting with with the first w what are you wearing today? So I'm wearing one of our gun club check tweed blazers. This is actually one of the most iconic tweed patterns out there. If you have, I'm sure probably somewhere you have this copy of this book, Scottish estate tweeds yep. published by Johnston's of, of Elgin. And uh, the cover of the book is just this pattern all over. But weirdly, they don't make it anymore. So we had to have this made just for us. I love things that are quintessential that are, classic yeah. so we had to have this made this fabric woven just for us uh i'm wearing uh one of our rugby shirts this is actually this is a replica of uh the england wales rugby team's jersey from a very famous match in 1923 and the, is this the english version or the welsh version it's white it's so a I'm combined gonna, okay. england wales team so the sport of rugby according to the mythology was invented in uh, 1823 at rugby school in England. To celebrate 100 years of the sport, they had at the original playing field of the school, rugby school, it's a high school in England, wow. they had an England-Wales combined team 
versus Scotland Ireland combined team. And uh, this is this is basically a replica of the England Wales teams jersey from that match in 1923. Wow. wow. Um, I'm wearing some very dirty some very dirty uh, chinos. It's below the it's below the camera level, so so perfectly fine, and it looks appropriately designer, like you've been uh, on the cutting floor. I actually see some threads there. Yep. So yes, chinos in, in in stone. It looks like indeed, and then uh, and then a new pair of Adidas that I just got. I actually forget what these things are called, but they have the spiny rubber, uh, which comes up really almost you know on top of the toe which is uh which is a pretty cool i love these yeah Yeah. (laughs) and 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 what is uh what's affixed to the uh to the jacket there so this is a an enamel metal badge uh that comes with each of our blazers um it's uh it's derived from in the sport of rowing if you're a member of certain prestigious clubs or if you're a member of the stewards enclosure at henley royal regatta for instance um instead of giving you tickets to get in to the those areas of the regatta they usually give you a metal badge if you're a member and it goes through your buttonhole so when we were first designing this line or when i was first kind of coming up with these weird branding ideas and yeah. and so on i thought instead of having like a paper or cardboard hang tag we would have a badge just like those Henley stewards enclosure badges or Leander club or whatever the, the, the club might be. And they do similar ones. It's very English. They have similar ones for guards polo club okay. for center court at Wimbledon and so on. Um, but this it's is a actually a lot more elegant than the lanyard that you often see people who have all access passes. Oh wear. yeah. Yeah. This is like the OG, you yeah. know, and very fancy version. Yeah. So this is made. This is all handmade in England um, with vitreous enamel, um, and it's made by the same people who make the Henley and Wimbledon and Guards Polo Club wow. uh, badges. Yeah. Well, so <laughs> so the next W being who, and you have mentioned that that the jacket and the rugby shirt are rowing blazers. Rowing blazers, rowing blazers. These are old Ralph Lauren pants. Okay, and and Adidas. And you mentioned these are new the shoes. Adidas shoes. How yeah. About you, how about your socks? Do you know who makes your socks? You know, I don't. I have a lot of corgi socks, though. Okay. Very traditional English sock maker. But um, I always wear one red and one blue sock. Interesting. I've done this since I was like three years old or so, since I was like conscious of what I was putting on. And uh, I've just never really seen any reason to stop. I get asked about it all the time. Sometimes I give fake answers and <laughs> say, oh, it's in this <laughs> club. It's... Really right, kind of right. messed up. I can't talk about it, or I don't know. I sometimes I make things up, but the truth is, I just started and I've never really stopped. But I always wear one red and one blue sock. So I've a, I have drawers that are just all kinds of miscellaneous red and blue socks from all over the place. Some are nice, some are not nice, some are cheap, some are some have patterns on them. Okay, it kind of varies, but gotcha. that's consistent. Oh wow, oh, that's a great one. That's I mean that's better than <laughs> Agnelli with the uh, with the watch on the outside of his uh, his cuff. Oh yeah, the watch I have. Oh a, yeah, what watch do you have? Vintage seventies Seiko watch with an okay. orange face. I've been really, I don't know, I've been really into the orange face lately. Okay, uh, next W, which I think in a lot of menswear circles is is almost irrelevant, but I like to sort of probe how relevant it might be for you. When do you know what season each of these items is? If if there is a season. Well, it's pretty easy because the, you know, this jacket came out. This jacket is our own brand, Rowing Blazers. Yeah, and it, so you it, know. It came out this season. Yep. This rugby shirt is a what I would call a classic in the Rowing Blazers line. It mm-hmm. came Seasonless. out a year ago, but we have it forever. Yeah. Um, these old Ralph Lauren khakis, I don't think they have any season necessarily attached yep. to them. And then the Adidas are also easy because they're brand new. They are what they are. And and then the last W being why, you know, so so you're meeting with me today. You've got another media uh, appointment later in the day. Um, why did you choose this particular ensemble? Man, I mean, I knew for sure you were going to be in a suit. I don't think I've ever seen you out of a suit except I saw your Indiana Jones, speaking of Indiana Jones costume for Halloween. Um, so I knew I had to wear a jacket to just kind of for symmetry for the video, if nothing else. <laughs> okay. I've been good. looking for any excuse, honestly, actually to wear this. This is from our own, from our own collection. And, uh, 
uh, yeah, I've been looking for any opportunity to wear it, really. I think you have to wear something relatively understated under this. Mm -hmm. I yeah. love the rugby shirt under jacket look. Yeah. Obviously, it's also just good for our brand. Yeah. Um, so I, I grabbed a white rugby shirt. I love the rose peeking out, though. Yeah. You know, just these little Well, and it's things. color appropriate, too, and you get a little pop of green in there. Exactly. Yeah. It all was just perfect. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, the khakis and the Adidas was just something pretty understated. Foregone to, conclusion. To just, go just flows exactly. and the rest. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you're direct to consumer primarily. Um, and, you know, that's an interesting choice. And, and I feel like, you know, for young designers today, actually the barriers to entry to the industry have gone up because of direct to consumer being such a compelling component of a brand. Whereas in the past, you know, you could just make your line and then sell it to wholesale accounts and you really didn't have any financial risk until that order came in. Yep. Um, do you think that that's true? And do you think that that's, that's a problem in terms of creativity that the barriers to entry are higher or, you know, as, as a, a brand doing this, do you think it's just, you know, just, just the cycle marching on and this is the new normal? No, I mean, I think there's, I think it's, uh, the barriers to entry in some ways are higher. In some ways they're not. It all depends on what you want to do. I mean, everything we make, we make in pretty small batches. It's not like we have to go to China and we have to order 20,000 of these jackets to be made in order to even get going. And that's going to then require us that if we don't have an order from Nordstrom or Bloomingdale's, wherever it might be, for all those units, then we're not even really going to be able to start making 10 or right. 25 or 50. Right. We're, we do things very differently. We're making these jackets 50 at a time. We mm -hmm. started making them 10 at a time and 25 at a time, and now they're 50 and 100 and 200 at a time here in New York. And the fact that we, the fact that now we're in an era where direct to consumer is a much more popular route. It allows us to do that, actually. Um, it allows us to make things in small batches. It allows us to to make to sort of start small in a way. And I think the old model that you're describing that really required people to get these big wholesale orders w was kind of tied to. You know, it's not necessarily an old model, but just a different model of production as well, where you're working with a big, big factory. We call our place in the garment district our factory. Right. But like I said, it's like a room. I mean, okay, the, it, one thing that's actually been cool as we've been working with them is they've moved to a bigger space. They've gone from four people to 12 people, or maybe now it's 15. Um, and that's been a cool thing to see. But that's a very different proposition from, you know, ordering some stuff from China and yeah. talking thousands or tens of thousands of units where you have to then have wholesale. So it's just, it's, I don't think it's necessarily, you know, when you even everything out harder or easier now, it's just a little bit different. Mm -hmm. I love direct to consumer though, because it allows you to control the brand story. It allows you to control the presentation. Um, you know, we control the website, we control our social media and with our own store, with our own customer service, we control what we're saying and how we're saying it. And I mentioned earlier, I mean, we work with a few wholesale accounts. I mean, we have a few stores that we work with in the world. And the ones that we do work with, you know, we're really, we feel very good about their ability to present the product in the right way. Beams, yeah. Yeah, you've got United the right Arrows in Japan, regard. Journal yeah. Standard. Yeah. The Japanese are great to work with. I mean, mm -hmm. those stores in particular, you know, they're not going to put it next to some weird brand that doesn't make sense. Yeah you know that the in-store staff is going to know what they're talking about. Right. And the reverence with which they approach every product is, you know, exactly. it has to make you feel good when you go in and you see your, your items hanging. You know, they're not going to mark it down. And right. I mean, there, I could talk about that for a long time, like just preserving the brand's value, protecting, defending the brand as a young brand. I mean, that's so, so, so important. Yeah. 
Well, listen, Jack, we might need to do a part two at some point, but uh, our time is at an end. Thanks so much for coming in. That's a wrap. Um, follow Rowing Blazers on Instagram and I think Twitter, or maybe not. Uh, We're not so active on Twitter. Okay. Instagram, Facebook, yeah, and, uh, and our physical store, too. Yeah, yeah. Come on down and uh, follow me at handofthelaw.com on Twitter and Instagram. And uh, thanks so much for coming in. Thank you. Appreciate it. You've been listening to The Laws of Style with Douglas Hand. For more information, go to our website at www.hballp.com. And you can also follow us on Instagram and Twitter at, at Hand of the Law. Thank you for tuning in and stay stylish.